Let's give a go at section 1.8, direct products and direct sums. Uh, following the category stuff from section 1.7, we'll bump into categories a little bit in this section. Uh, but as I've mentioned, they'll play a, a relatively small role, but they do pop up a bit more in this section than most of the others, as we dealt with products and co-products in the setting of categories. Now, we've already been introduced to uh, the idea of taking a uh, product of, of two groups, and we're really extending that quite a bit. Uh, we took a direct product of two groups, I guess, in section 1.1, so pretty early on. And then, as well as now, we just um, took a couple of groups and kind of isolated them in some sense. Uh, if we took a direct product of two groups, we had a first group and all the manipulations were done to ordered pairs. The first of <clears throat> the first components of that ordered pair coming from one group and the second components from the other and the two never interacting. And we'll do a similar thing here, except we're going to take this way beyond the idea of two groups. And these ideas of uh, products of groups will play a role time permitting, if we go through a classification of all finitely generated abelian groups, and therefore all finite abelian groups, uh, we'll be able to cleanly classify them in terms of cyclic groups and in terms of uh, products, direct products, or if you like direct sums, direct sums, we'll deal with cyclic groups and treat them as additive groups at that stage, as you may have done in senior level analysis, not part one, you might have done that in senior, I'm sorry, senior algebra, uh, part two. So what we'll do is take a um, direct product of a bunch of groups over an indexing set I. Now the thing is indexing set I may not be finite, it may not even be countable. For example, it could be the interval from zero to one of real numbers. So there's a lot of numbers between zero and one, it's not even a countable set. Uh, I desperately want to interpret the elements of these direct products uh, as tuples. If we had n sets, then we'd have n tuples uh, in Rn, maybe your favorite vector space. The elements of Rn are n tuples, be they n tuples of points with coordinates or vectors with components, they still come to you as n tuples. So I want to use that verbiage to try to make this more tangible. And when we define this uh, direct product, it's going to be defined on a Cartesian product of a bunch of sets. So I've got some things uh, running in the background here. Let's go back to, we're in section 0 0.5 here, what it means to talk about a Cartesian product of a, a family of sets. So again, from section 0 0.5, a sub i, or i, is an index chosen from indexing set capital I. Let this be a family of sets. We're going to talk about the Cartesian product of those sets. If it was a finite set, then it'd be no big deal. We'd get um, n tuples if the cardinality of the indexing set was i. And we're trying to mimic that. And here's how it's done. The Cartesian product of the sets A sub i, as I ranges over this indexing set, is the set of all functions f mapping the indexing set into the union, as I ranges over the indexing set of the a sub i, such that f takes index i and gives out an element of set a sub i. This working for all values of the indices, the notation for this set, and similarly, the notation we'll have when we take direct products of, of graphs is um, given with a product notation, same notation we had in categories, in fact. So here's how to make sense out of that. So we're getting out for this function i. Uh, every time we input an index, we get out an element of a set. You input index i, you get out an element of set a sub i. So if indexing set i were the interval from zero to one, closed interval say, 
then we would have for every real number between zero and one, we'd have some set, some a sub i for each i between zero and one. And I might interpret that i parameter is representing like a position in a, an, an n tuple. Well, it won't be, it won't work for n tuple. It'd be the cardinality of i tuple, if anything. And the problem is that's, that's uncountably infinite. But still, we can uh, think of index i as fixing a position. And it's the function that tells you what's in that position. In the ith position of the elements of this Cartesian product is some element of set capital A sub i. For us, the sets will be groups, and the, uh, the f of i's will be elements of those groups. But think of it in terms of, um, of n tuples. Only I can't use some little finite set as the indexing set. We're using this set, which could be a big set, could be a finite set, could be a truly huge set, in which case we got a bunch of sets here. Or in what we're about to do, we got a bunch of groups. So our definition comes to us as follows. Uh, consider an indexed family of groups, G sub i, i an indexing set capital I, define a binary operation on the Cartesian product of the sets, as defined in chapter zero, as follows. So in the, uh, we'll call this the direct product or the complete direct sum, uh, where we may be dealing with additive groups, uh, direct product is a term I'll most commonly use. Uh, so we're defining uh, this direct product as a group with these things as the elements of the group. Uh, if we had a product of just two groups, as we did in chapter one, the elements would be uh, ordered pairs. Here, I kind of want to think of them as ordered tuples as well of some sort but the index i gives a position. We got the elements. We need a binary operation, all right? As we just saw in chapter zero, the elements of this Cartesian product are actually described as functions. So if we take functions f and g in that direct sum, remember what that means is f and g map the indexing set into the Cartesian product of those sets, such that f of i and g of i are elements of group, this time, G sub i. And this holds for all indices. So things are still being done very much index-wise. Uh, when I look at the ith entry, if you will, it's entirely related to, related to group G sub i. Uh, it's computed using i's, f of i, g of i. So we still are going to have these groups kind of isolated. Uh, in the ith position or the ith coordinate, we're always dealing with group G sub i. And any binary operations, as you're about to see, will be entirely happening inside G sub i as concerns index lowercase i. So define for two such functions, that is elements of the Cartesian product, define the product fg, mapping the index set into the Cartesian product of the sets uh, to be the function given by mapping index i to f of i, g of i. So here we've got the binary operation in group g sub i used. So we're taking an element of g sub i, f of i, and another element of capital G sub i, lowercase g sub i, remember those are in group G sub i, and we're multiplying those together, as we can do in group G sub i. It's a group that's got a binary operation. So we're using the binary operations in all the groups to define a binary operation on the Cartesian product. That's the same thing you did in chapter one when we had two groups and we took a, a direct product of the two groups. It's just a bit more involved here due to the fact that the indexing set could be large. Uh, by taking uh, such a definition, 
we actually do have that FG is an element of the Cartesian product. Uh, all we needed was a function uh, that mapped the indexing set uh, appropriately, mapped the indexing set such that index I was mapped to something in G sub I, and FG does that. So we got that going for us. Um, we still need to establish this really is a group, uh, more comments than that to come, but the set, the Cartesian product of the groups together with this binary operation is called a direct product, or if you like the comp complete direct sum of the family of groups G sub I. Uh, by the way, uh, we will use this notation, we'll identify uh, function f that's in the Cartesian product of all of those graphs, we'll just define it as a set or we'll uh, identify as the word I use. We'll identify elements of the direct product of these groups as this, a sub i such that i is an indexing set, capital I and little element a sub i comes from um, group g sub i. So I've referred this to as, uh, as an ordered set, and technically sets aren't ordered. Uh, I'm kind of thinking ordered in tuple, but you know, I got all my problems with in tuples. Uh, the indexing set may not be finite, may not even be countable, but anyhow, I want to think of these uh, as being in some sense ordered by the indexing set. A little bit more in formality in a crude sense. So I'm, I'm grasping for um, something intuitive here. We can think of the elements of that direct product as um, cardinality of I tuples is how I always word this. This is my attempt to try to make some sense out of this. And the binary operations performed component wise. Yeah, that's exactly what you're getting here. Component wise computations of the binary operation in the direct product. If the indexing set were simply one through n, we denote the direct product simply as the usual kind of thing. It's probably the notation. I think this is the notation we used in chapter one. If we were dealing with multiplicative groups, it was. If we were dealing with additive groups, there's a slightly different notation. But if the indexing set is just the symbols one through n, then what are the elements of the direct product? Then they're n tuples. There's a position one and a position two up to a position n in these n tuples. How do you multiply two n tuples together? Component wise. We're doing the same thing. The only problem is the indexing set might be really big. I'd still like to refer to them as uh, I tuples or cardinality of I tuples. And I'd still like to talk about positions, maybe um, coordinates in these, um, in these various tuples, these cardinality of I tuples, except instead of saying one through N, I have to say uh, they're in position lowercase I, right? Lowercase I is gonna drive everything. So there's an attempt to uh, make some sense out of this. Does it really work? Yeah. Uh, theorem 1.8.1, leave the proof as uh, you know, to the reader, as they say, as an exercise. And would be bad idea to run through this exercise uh, just to make sure you got a grasp of how things are computed in these direct products over indexing sets, capital I. But the claim is if we take a family of groups, G sub I over indexing set I, then the direct product actually is a group. Uh, so you need to make sure the thing we define really is a binary operation. I think we're covered on that. Um, you need to make sure that we have associativity uh, and identity and every element has an inverse. Uh, yeah, you got associativity because you have, you do computations, you perform the binary operation component wise. Well, when you look at a component, when you look at the ith component, all of a sudden you're in group G sub I and you got associativity in group G sub I. What do you think the identity element is in this group? Well, it'd be the, if you will, cardinality of I tuple 
of all identities. In position I is the identity of group G sub I. And since you multiply component wise, that'll be the identity. Inverses, similarly. So wouldn't be a bad idea uh, to try to scratch out a little argument uh, that this actually is the case, that we, you do have a group here. Uh, another claim for any fixed K and I, the map pi sub K defined by taking the uh, direct product and mapping it to group G sub K, subscript K being associated with this mapping here, by simply taking uh, F, the element of the direct product, and associating it with F of K, mapping it to F of K, uh, that would be simply the group G sub K, uh, is an epimorphism. It's a claim that is it's an onto homomorphism of groups. So uh, we're taking the giant product and ignoring everything, but the, uh, if you will, the case component or the case entry. Uh, this is called a canonical projection. Claim is it's onto, claim is uh, it's a homomorphism. Again, it's very, fairly straightforward to show that, but it wouldn't hurt to run through it to try to make uh, this strange notation of how the binary operation works and the representation of these elements of the direct, uh, direct product. Uh, make that a little more tangible to you. But we'll refer to the, um, the canonical projection. Uh, it projects a product onto kind of a, a constituent group in that product. We'll have a mapping that goes in the other direction uh, here shortly as well. It takes a particular group and embeds it in a product. Okay, first claim is uh, actually fairly um, category theory intense says, let G sub I be a family of groups indexing set capital I, let H be a group, some particular group, and let phi sub I be a family of homomorphisms that map group H into group G sub I, phi sub I, G sub I, index I. So this family of um, is indexed also by set capital I. The claim is there's a unique homomorphism, phi mapping H into the direct product of those groups, such that pi sub I composed with phi equals phi sub I, this holding for all values of the indices. And this property determines the direct product uniquely up to isomorphism. In other words, the direct product of uh, a family of groups is a category, or I'm sorry, is in the category of groups. So when we looked at the category of all groups and we defined um, products on categories, this is exactly what we needed. Actually, let's start. I've got everything in the background that I need. Here's what we had. Um, in terms of the definition of a product and a category from the previous section. So what we're doing down here is taking a product of the family of A sub I's indexed by the indexing set. And it's the same thing up here, except the A sub I's are groups. We define an object P of that category uh, together with a family of morphisms, pi sub i, they map that product into the a sub i's. Here we've got the um, pi sub i as the canonical projection, and indeed it mapped uh, the product onto the ith component onto uh, group g sub i, pi sub i did. So we, we're given this with the um, canonical projections for the pi's upstairs, such that for any object B, any object B, okay, we're taking the object B to be this group H. Oops. So object B down here is played by the role of uh, group H in section 1.8. Uh, the family of morphisms, uh, the phi sub i's, 
uh, mapped that object B to the A sub I's. Up here, we've got the uh, phi sub I's mapping object B, I mean uh, group H, to the A sub I's, I mean the G sub I's. So we've got the exact same parallel between these two definitions. Down here, um, to have a product, we required the, the existence of a unique morphism. And remember, morphisms in the category of groups are homomorphisms of groups. So uh, in the category setting, there's a unique morphism, uh, phi mapping B to P, the product, such that we get this particular composition. It's the same thing we got up here. We're uh, claiming there is a unique homomorphism, homomorphisms of groups, are morphisms in the category of all groups. So same thing. This maps uh, the uh, arbitrary object into the product. Down here we had phi mapping, hmm, arbitrary object B into the product P, same setting. And the composition that's required down here to have a product in the category is the same as we have up here. We've even used the same symbols. We've got a comp, only difference is there's a composition symbol down here and up here uh, it's understood that uh, we're dealing with function compositions with these homomorphisms when we write them that way. So theorem 1.8.2 is making a category claim. They say something about this property determines um, the direct product uniquely up to isomorphism. Um, we had used the term equivalent in the category setting. And you'll recall in the category of all groups, equivalences were given by isomorphisms. So that equivalence idea from categories will link up with this idea of isomorphisms here in the category of all groups. So let's go through proof of that. Okay. Uh, there's the claim. So let's see, we'll start with a family of groups. Uh, we'll be given uh, group H and given the phi sub i's, a whole bunch of group homomorphisms. Then we need to find phi as desired, mapping H into the uh, direct product, satisfying a certain um, composition, and we'll have to show uniqueness. Okay, uh, theorem 0.5.2, we'll take a look at that shortly, uh, tells us the mapping of the sets as given here uh, is a unique function satisfying a composition. So let's run back to uh, section five again, 0.5.2. I think I've got it waiting for us. There we go. So the statement here is, we got a family of sets, All right? We're back in section 0.5, that's about sets. And let's just try to correlate the pieces. We got some pi sub i's mapping D into A sub i's. Uh, up here, the pi sub i's mapped the product into the A sub i's, the uh, canonical projections where the pi sub i's, so we've got that lurking in the background. It's uh, not explicitly mentioned here other than that little composition right there. Uh, we got a family of maps, uh, phi sub i, mapping C into the A sub i's. Okay, here's the phi sub i's in, in our setting. And the claim in the set theoretic setting is there exists a unique map mapping uh, C to D such that this composition holds over all indices. So that's the unique phi. We're mapping, um, let's see, C to D. D would be the product, right? It's mapping onto the product. And C, by the phi sub i's, it was mapped to the G sub i's in our setting. The C of that result would be the H of what we're talking about now. So indeed, phi maps H to the product. H is, the, is C in this other setting, and the product is D. 
So it's this result that gives us the existence of a unique mapping satisfying the composition. We need a lot more than that. Uh, but theorem 0 0.5.2 uh, does give us uh, a fee that uh, does this type of mapping and it satisfies this composition for all values of the indices. So we've got the composition satisfied. We got the function phi. Uh, we're missing homomorphism and uniqueness. So we need to confirm uh, such a phi is a homomorphism. Okay, uh, take A and B to be elements of group H. Phi maps H to this group. So we need to make sure it satisfies the homomorphism property. We take two elements of H and apply phi of uh, AB. Well, the mapping phi uh, gives us phi of A is uh, simply mapped to uh, the element of the direct product given by phi sub I of A for each I in the index uh, that comes out of the the set theoretic setting that allows us to get this composition satisfied. So what phi of something is, is the phi sub i is applied to A as a, an element of the direct product group. So by the very definition of phi, we get this out. Um, hey, the phi sub i's, the phi sub i's, here they are. We're a bunch of homomorphisms. We've got phi sub i's applied to a product where phi sub i is a homomorphism. It's a product of the phi sub i's, homomorphism property there. And then this peels apart as um, phi sub i, uh, phi sub i of a, phi sub i of b as i ranges over uh, indexing set i. Think of this as the entry in the ith position of a cardinality of I tuple, then that is precisely the product phi of A times phi of B. Uh, phi of A, how do you multiply something times something else in the direct product uh, group? Uh, by multiplying corresponding components, as it were. What's the ith component of phi of A? Uh, phi of A, the ith component is phi sub i of A. Ith component of this thing. Similarly, ith component of that thing. You're multiplying the ith components together. Of course, this multiplication is happening in um, the direct product uh, group, pi of the g sub i's. But it's the definition of multiplication that gets us to this last line. And there's your homomorphism property. Phi of A, B equals phi of A, phi of B. So we've got uh, homomorphism, uh, uniqueness. Uniqueness is still a concern somewhere. Uh, consider definition 1.7.2. Uh, this is uh, what we were looking at earlier, uh, what a product in a category is. We've actually already been through this, uh, this part of it. Um, we have uh, the unique uh, morphism mapping um, B to P. We do have the uniqueness. Actually, the set theory result gave us the uniqueness. Uh, we've shown it's a uh, homomorphism. We know the composition holes and the set theory stuff gave us that too. So what we got then uh, correlating this stuff with the definition of a product in a category, that's what definition 1.7.2 is. That's what we pulled up on the side. That tells us then that this thing here is a product in the categorical sense is given in that definition 1.7.2. So we can use the properties of categories from section 1.7. Uh, so let's see, we've got uh, the phi, the uniqueness. Uh, there was a claim about up to isomorphism and that's where we're gonna use the category theory stuff. Theorem 1.7.3, tells us any two products of elements in a category are equivalent. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in the category of all groups, uh, an equivalence, the verbiage from 
uh, is a group isomorphism. So uh, saying two products are equivalent in the category of groups is the same as saying two products of a given collection of groups, a family of groups, uh, are isomorphic because equivalences are isomorphisms. The very definition of equivalence dealt really hands-on with compositions of uh, a couple of morphisms in the category setting, a couple of homomorphisms here. We'd require a composition of homomorphisms between two equivalent groups uh, to compose to give the identity. So it must be then that they're one-to-one -one and onto homomorphisms. That is, they're isomorphisms. So that gives us proposition 1.8.2, a little bit with a the category theory. Uh, we're going to have, I think, just one more result. Uh, we'll look at co-products here, and I'll pull up the definition of that. Uh, remember, when we talk co-products, there's a lot of these, uh, the mappings have simply been reversed. It's what happened with a co-product in relation to products, that dual results, we call them. Uh, another observation, we're going to shift from um, arbitrary direct products to something um, eh, weaker, I guess, because that's the name of it, something smaller in some sense. Uh, if each of the G sub i's is a billion and we take the direct product, we'll get an abelian uh, group for the direct product. Why is that? Uh, because you do all the computations component-wise, binary operations defined component-wise. Well, if you do all the com computations component-wise, that is you do computations related to index i in group G sub i, well, if G sub i is a billion, then you got um, commutivity in uh, component i. You got commutivity in component i, you got commutivity everywhere uh, because that's how uh, the binary operation behaves. It computes things, calculations are made component-wise. My verbiage, this idea of component-wise and positions or coordinates and, and cardinality of i-tuples. But since we do the computations the way they're defined, then a billion G sub i's will give us an abelian product. Uh, so uh, the product of a bunch of abelian groups uh, is also a product in the category of all abelian groups. We know products um, of groups are, again, groups established above, uh, we just need to make sure the property of a billionness commutivity is preserved. And if you put a billion groups in, you get a billion groups out. We made some comment about the category of a billion groups in the previous section, very much in passing. And uh, this is probably the last we'll see of that. So now for um, something a touch weaker, um, as it's called, uh, we'll use this to find some normal subgroups. So we'll get back in the normal subgroup thing uh, with this idea of an external weak direct product. External weak direct product of a family of groups, G sub i, indexed by i, denoted the usual product notation, but we got a little superscript of a W there to indicate the weakness is the following. It's the set of all elements of the Cartesian product with a condition put on them. All elements F in the Cartesian product such that F of I equals E sub I. E sub I is the end identity in group G sub I for all but a finite number of the indices. So if I look at an element of an external weak direct product it has potentially loads and loads of um, coordinates, positions, but all but a finite number of those are identities. Identities in the appropriate corresponding group. In the ith position, we get the identity from group G sub i, all but for a finite number of values of i. 
if all the groups G sub I are additive abelian groups, then this um, external weak direct product is called an external direct sum, and we'll denote it with summation notation. And we'll deal with abelian groups a little bit in this setting also. Hey, if the indexing set is finite, then there's no difference between a weak direct product and a direct product. Uh, possibly you dealt, I'd be surprised if you dealt with general direct products in senior level algebra. Um, and I'd be shocked if you dealt with weak direct products in senior level algebra. You usually dealt with finite direct products. Uh, so the weak doesn't even come up in senior level algebra. But a claim, I promised you some uh, normal subgroup stuff. Here's uh, three claims. We'll go through the first one of these, you know, indicated with the blue fonts. If G sub I is a family of groups, then the um, external weak direct product of those groups is a normal subgroup of the regular direct product of those groups. So we've got a subgroup. Um, and the claim is that subgroup is a normal subgroup. Uh, I suppose we would need to establish this actually as a subgroup. Um, I, I don't think we addressed that. I think we've taken that as given. I don't think that's addressed in, um, in the proof of this. Secondly, here comes um, a new mapping. something uh, we'll give a title to, so I wanted to scroll down a little. For every K in the uh, indexing set, the map iota sub K, taking G sub K and putting it inside the weak direct product given by, so we're defining the iota sub Ks, iota sub K of A, say is represented as um, this um, ordered cardinality of I tuple, and this is how we're representing elements of direct products. And so it'll work for these weak direct products as well. Uh, given by these components where A sub I equals E sub I, if I doesn't equal K, and A sub K equals A itself otherwise. So what we get out is identity, 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 until you hit the value of I equal to K, and then you get A itself out. So we've taken this little A to be an element of this group G sub K, and we've kept it in the Kth position here and surrounded it by an infinite number of, well, surrounded it by nothing but identities. So there's identities everywhere except in position K. In position K, this little element of G sub K is mapped to A itself. You input an A, you get out an A in the kth position. A sub K equals A is a notation for that. Kth position, we get A out. Everywhere else, it's identities. Claim is this is a monomorphism, a one-to-one uh, -one homomorphism of groups. We'll leave the argument of that uh, as homework. Uh, straightforward, again, you know, maybe good practice, uh, getting used to what goes on with these um, direct products or these external direct products in this, uh, in this case, external weak direct products in this case. And thirdly, the claim is um, iota sub i of g sub i is a normal subgroup of uh, the direct product. Uh, notice iota sub i of g sub i actually lives in the weak direct product because it's got all m identities for components. Um, and that's a fairly straightforward computation as well. Uh, might do you good to run through a proof of part three. This little uh, mapping iota uh, sub k is called the canonical injection. So we had a canonical projection, the pi sub i's, that took, um, took products and gave out individual groups. That was the canonical projection. The canonical injection was the other thing. It takes a group and gives out something in the direct product. Uh, okay, it gives out something in the weak direct product, but everything in the weak direct product is contained in the direct product, right? I mean, there's a statement about it being a subgroup up here. So uh, in the near future, we'll be seeing more of these uh, iota sub k's 
we use the pi sub i's when we were talking products. We'll use the iota sub i's uh, when we talk coproducts shortly. But let's look at a proof of this claim about normal subgroup. Normal subgroup claims are usually computational, and this one is too. Okay, it's a little crowded, but I think it all fits on one slide. So claim is, um, this is a normal subgroup of the direct product. The external weak direct product is a normal subgroup of the regular or direct product. We'll use some piece of the definition of normal subgroup. And what we'll do is we'll show for all A in the big group, the direct product, and for N equal to the external weak direct product here, that A in A inverse is a subset of N. Here, 1.5.1 part four said a bunch of stuff, part of which the implication is if this is satisfied, then you got a normal subgroup. Okay, so um, let's do some multiplication of elements. You know what those elements are going to look like because you know where they come from. Take n to be an element of the external weak direct product. So I'm taking an element of, um, here we go, an element of capital N. What's it look like? Uh, when we're identifying them with these, these sets here, these ordered sets, whatever they were called, uh, where uh, N of I simply comes from group G sub I, just like in the regular direct product. In addition to that, though, we have N sub I equals the identity from that group G sub I for all but finitely many of the indices. Um, say those indices where we don't get the uh, identity out, say those come from uh, indexing set I sub zero, a subset of indexing set I, a finite subset in fact. So we're gonna let I sub zero denote the set containing the indices when you don't get the identity out. It's a little set because you get the identity out all but a finite number of times. Uh, what's up with this finite stuff? Well, it's because it's uh, an external weak direct product and that's what the external weak direct product was. Uh, elements of the direct product such that this thing about all but finitely many of the components being the identity. So that's what N looks like in great detail. Uh, let A be an element of the direct product. Well, then A looks like this, where these A of I's are elements of group G sub I. We had mentioned, um, and I think it was the first theorem in this section, uh, showing what the identity is. Uh, I didn't really address inverses, but it shouldn't come, to, uh, come as a surprise to you. Eh? The inverse of element A is simply the um, ordered set of inverses component-wise. So A has ith component, if you will, A of I. So A inverse has ith component, A of I inverse. How are you gonna multiply these things together? Component-wise. Uh, in terms of individual lowercase i's, in terms of fixed values of the index. Okay, and this should be the inverse. In fact, we'll do that here shortly. Not so much for the identity, but for something to describe this conjugation. Now, let's look at, uh, sorry for the crowded in stuff, but it did fit on one slide, so I can see the whole thing in one sitting. So that's a downside of this online stuff, uh, but, Consider A in A inverse. A, we had this representation of A. N, we had this representation of N. And there was more to the story for this one because we had a bunch of identities here. A inverse, as we just described, will be this. So we're multiplying, if you will, this cardinality of I tuple times this cardinality of I tuple times this cardinality of I tuple. How do you do that? Component wise. You simply take corresponding components for a given i value. We'll take a of i, n of i, 
and A of I inverse. I multiply those together, and that will determine, if you will, the, uh, the ith component of this tuple. That's the definition of multiplication in the direct product or the semi-direct product, uh, sorry, or the um, external weak direct product for that matter. Um, a of I, N of I, A sub I inverse, these are all in group uh, G sub I, because that's where the computations are done. That's where the things come from. Uh, so the product of those three are actually in G sub I. So the um, ith component of this thing here is in group G sub I. So it's, it's of the proper form uh, to be in the direct product. We're actually trying to show this thing A in A inverse, trying to show it's in the external weak direct product. Step one, hey, the components are in the right place but we need that thing with the identities. Remember, the ith component of the lowercase n equals the identity for a bunch of indices, all indices except those in the little finite set we denoted i sub zero. So if we take an index that's not in i sub zero, that n of i is gonna be the identity. So we'll have a of i, n of i, a of i inverse is a of i identity e sub i times a of i inverse. The inverses will get together, give you the identity in g sub i, all the actions happening in g sub i once we choose an index, lowercase i. This works for all indices except those in set i sub zero. Might work for those as well, but I'm just trying to get a finiteness out of this. So we get this um, a in a inverse, its ith component is E sub i for all but finitely many values of the indices. It's true for all indices not in I sub zero, and that's all but finitely many. And it might be true for some of them in I sub zero as well, but we've got what we need to say, therefore, A in A inverse, this thing we wrote in terms of those expressions, is an element of the external weak direct product. A in A inverse has all but finitely many components as the identity. And that's what it means to be in the external weak direct product. Uh, N was an arbitrary element. We've shown A in A inverse is in N itself. This thing was N. Lowercase N was arbitrary, so we can replace that with a whole set N the way we usually do when dealing with normal subsets. And we get A capital N, A inverse. That is A uh, external weak direct product. A inverse is a subset of N, which is the external weak direct product. And that's exactly what we needed to show. We need A in A inverse, a subset of N to show N equals this thing here as a normal subgroup. Theorem 1.5.1 part four. So this thing here, is a normal subgroup of the direct product. Back to the notes. Okay, and some other claims uh, easily verified. See that one? Uh, that one did illustrate how you multiply in direct products and in semi-direct products and how you use the information that you're dealing with um, an external weak direct product. Sorry, I shouldn't say semi-direct product. That's a topic for the future. So there's more to this than what we're dealing with in, in the Hungerford book even. So we mentioned those uh, mappings given above were called canonical injections. Another result, okay, this one deals with uh, ultimately deals with co-products. <clears throat> so I want to uh, pull up the definition of co-product from the previous section and compare it to what we have in this theorem. I think I've got it lingering right here. Okay, so here's our definition of co-product from the category setting. Here's what we're dealing with here. Ultimately, we're showing um, that an external direct sum 
of abelian groups is a co-product in the category of abelian groups. If I can lower that just a touch. Here we go. The statement is, let A sub I be a family of abelian groups. Um, <clears throat> we'll use additive notation. The highlight, I lose my lower window. So additive abelian groups, not just any old groups. If B is an additive abelian group, so we're choosing an arbitrary object here, and psi sub i maps the A sub i's into B for all values of the index. This is a family of homomorphisms. Then there's a unique homomorphism mapping the external direct sum of these A sub i's to B. It's given here such that we get this type of composition and this property determines the external direct sum uh, uniquely up to isomorphism. So we're about to do the same thing we did before, except uh, in a dual way. We've got mappings reversed from what we had before. What we're dealing with is really called a co-product in the um, category setting. So this could be restated more concisely as the external direct sum is a co-product in the category of abelian groups. So let's match up what's said about co-products down here with what's said in this theorem 1.8.5. Family of objects, uh, family of objects. A sub i's, the A sub i's correspond this time because we're dealing with abelian groups. So they chose to represent them with A's. Uh, family of morphisms, mapping the A sub i's into object S. Uh, okay, S will be um, the co-product that we're defining. We use the symbol S for co-products before. Uh, so we're using iotas, subscripted iotas, to map the A sub i's into the co-product, into this um, external direct sum thing. So it corresponds to the weak idea. They use different verbiage uh, for multiplicative and additive groups for some reason. But that's exactly what iota did. Our iota, the canonical injection, took a, um, a little g sub i and uh, mapped it to a direct, oops, mapped it to a direct product. That's exactly what our iotas did. Here we're going into something somewhat smaller than a direct product, but anyhow, um, the iotas, the canonical injections that we had are playing this role. Uh, and notice the canonical injection pops up. There it is in the composition. Uh, we're guaranteed, or we are to show in the theorem uh, that there exists a unique homomorphism psi mapping this external direct sum into, oh, oh sorry, I've lost it, kids. Uh, psi mapping the external direct sum into B, this abelian group. Down here it says for any object B, well, B is our abelian group. Uh, and family of morphisms, psi sub i's. So we've got the psi sub i's mapping the A sub i's to B down here. Same thing up here. We've even got at least those letters corresponding. There exists a unique morphism, psi mapping S, that is the uh, external direct sum to group B, such that this composition holds, and that's exactly what psi is doing. Psi is mapping the um, external direct sum into this group in this, this panel, this group B. So a uh, correspondence between parts. Down here, we wanted psi composed with iota sub i to equal psi sub i for all values of the index. Same thing up here. Just didn't write the composition symbol. We don't do that always when we're dealing with homomorphism. Down here, we were dealing with morphisms uh, and we uh, kind of more emphasize the the composition little circle uh, dealing with us. So that's the definition of a co-product. That's what we're doing. So we're showing that uh, external direct sums are co-products in the category of abelian groups. So 
we must need commutivity for this somewhere. So we'll keep our eyes out for commutivity. Let's look at a proof of that. Okay, uh, the statement again. If we take an element of the external direct sum, denote it with the, the a sub i's, or i is an indexing set i, of course. This is non-zero, that if that is if um, not all these things here are zero, uh, then only finitely many of the a sub i's are non-zero. Say a one a sub i one, a sub i two, a sub i r. Define psi mapping those things into a billion group B as, okay, we, we looked at non-zero up here, so I'm gonna take care of zero individually. Uh, of course, we're using zero to indicate the identities in these groups since we're treating them as additive groups. We really shifted gears here. Uh, so the E sub I's are represented by zeros in this case because we have additive groups. Uh, zero sub i's, I guess I could use if you want to distinguish between them, but the behavior in these groups is, is isolated uh, to the g sub i's when we do any computations. So define the psi mapping this um, external direct sum to a billion group B by taking zero in the external direct sum, uh, the tuple where all the entries are zeros or zeros of i's, if you like. Map that to the identity in B. Uh, of course, homomorphisms have to do that. And for non-zero entries, what we're going to do is take, apply psi to a non-zero element satisfying these conditions. Define that to be for index i1, apply psi sub i1 to a sub i1. For index i sub 2, apply psi sub i sub 2 to a sub i sub 2. In fact, this time define i sub 0 to be the i1 through i sub r's here. It's, it's the uh, values of the index where the, if you will, components of this thing here are non-zero. Now, one reason this finiteness is going to help, in fact, um, this arose somewhat in the, in the proof of the previous one, but quite explicitly here. We're going to add these up. You can only add things up, and here I'm using the summation symbol uh, as I would maybe just in algebra or calculus or statistics. We're simply summing over indices in this set i sub zero, or just summing over these, these values of the index, regular old summation stuff. So we're using additive notation because we're in additive groups. But you got to have finiteness. You're in a group. And I, if I didn't have the, um, the finiteness stuff that's given by the fact that we're dealing with, looking for the word weak somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, I don't explicitly see it, but this is an, uh, an, an external um, direct sum that didn't have the word weak associated with it when we use the additive notation again more of that but you've got the finiteness stuff uh, with this type of thing uh, if you didn't you're doomed right I can't take infinite sums in a group I can take infinite sums of real numbers if they converge because I got a metric and I can take limits and series are limits of sums but you don't have that structure in a group so if you're going to use the binary operation you can only use it a finite number of times unless you have some additional structure, but we don't. Um, if we had a topological group, maybe different story, but uh, all we have is um, a binary operation. So we can only apply it a finite number of times. And that's where the finiteness is coming in, in this um, external direct sum. If we use multiplicative notation, we'd call it an external weak uh, direct product. And we have a little W somewhere around here to indicate the weakness. Uh, the fact that all but finitely many, you know, blah, 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 or zero. So we're good on this sum. This actually does, you know, it's, it makes sense to add together a finite number of things. So we're explicitly using that finiteness here. Uh, that gives us psi defined 
on this um, external direct sum, we need to show it's a homomorphism and we need to show the composition thing. The homomorphism part, piece of cake. All these things are homomorphisms, aren't they? Yeah, all the size of whatever's are homomorphisms. The subscripted size was the family of homomorphisms. You know, they, they were localized in what they acted on. They acted on um, a billion group A sub I, size sub I did. But anyhow, a uh, piece of cake to show this is a homomorphism. Um, to show psi of this thing, um, I don't know exactly how to read it, uh, the <clears throat> tuple with entries A sub I plus the tuple with entries B sub I equals uh, psi of the A's plus psi of the B's is what we'd show to show homomorphism. Uh, the function composition also left as homework, uh, not hard to verify, but I was gonna keep an eye on where commutivity is used. Commutivity is used in showing this composition. So with that accepted, and it would be a bad idea to sit down and try to work through that. But with that established, we've got um, the existence of homomorphism psi that satisfies the composition property. Uniqueness is still uh, remains unproven in this setting. Okay. Um, let's see, I see the uniqueness in the shadows and observation first. For each uh, element of this uh, external direct sum with only finitely many non zero entries, non zero A sub I's, we can write this as a sum over index i chosen from i sub zero, iota sub i of a sub i. All right, here's why that is. Um, if we take an individual a sub i and apply iota sub i to it, the canonical uh, injection, what we're gonna get out is a, a giant tuple. The ith entry will be a sub i, and all the other entries will be identities. They'll be zeros in the conversation we're currently having. So when I take iota sub i of a sub i, that gives me an, an element of the uh, external direct sum. So it's a, it's a giant tuple of entries, but they're all zero except for one, the one in position i where we get out a sub i. So you're doing that over the non-zero entries, um, a sub i sub one, a sub i sub two, it's a notation we had on the previous slide. We put all those in this indexing set, i sub zero. So what you're doing is simply saying, uh, hey, if I've got something that's in this external direct sum, it's only got finitely many entries that are non-zero. We can write that by picking off an individual entry and surrounding it by zeros. Pick off a second individual non-zero entry, surround it by zeros and so forth. Add them all together, you get out exactly this. So we're uh, in some sense decomposing this element of the um, external direct sum into this sum of <clears throat> uh, in elements which are zero everywhere except for in one entry. And it allows us to introduce the, uh, the iota. So we can represent the elements of the external direct sum as this in terms of iotas. Iota embeds bunches, bunch of, uh, bunch of zeros in the iota application. All right, so we mentioned this to establish um, uniqueness. To show that you, that psi function with the mapping properties given above is unique, suppose we have another Greek letter, <clears throat> C. C maps the um, external direct sum to um, a billion group B. Suppose this is also a homomorphism that satisfies this particular composition. So remember this composition is of interest and it's kind of why we've introduced this representation of the elements. Let's apply C to 
an arbitrary element of the external direct sum, this thing. Well, we just saw that uh, that element of the external direct sum can be written in this form, this summation over uh, indexing set i sub zero. It's a finite sum, that's a big deal, as mentioned on the previous slide. So you wanna apply uh, homomorphism C to uh, a sum of a bunch of elements? No problem, it's a homomorphism that would, um, homomorphism property would tell us apply C to the bunch of elements and then do the summing. The binary operation is addition. So the very definition of homomorphism gives us that C of the sum is the sum of the Cs, if you will. So I still got the uh, iota sub i's in there. But remember, to satisfy the conditions we have above, we need C of iota sub i to equal psi sub i. And that's exactly what we've got here is that composition. Those two compose, we can replace it with uh, psi sub i uh, by that condition. Um, on the previous slide, we saw, left it as, you know, quote unquote, a homework problem to confirm that the uh, composition psi with iota sub i produced the psi sub i's. I said, this is where you need the commutivity. So we'll take that from the previous slide. Uh, the psi function satisfies this relationship as well. So we can replace the psi sub i with a composition psi with iota sub i. And now we'll just peel it apart. Uh, we're trying to show C uh, equals psi. We took the C inside a sum. Well, now we've got uh, psi. Psi is a homomorphism, so we'll take it and pull it out of the sum uh, and kind of do the same steps, the same couple of steps we did above, but do them backwards now. So let's see, we left off with this on that previous slide. Uh, psi is a homomorphism. So the sum of some size is the psi of the sum. The binary operation is addition. This was a representation of the a sub i's, the, the tuple of a sub i's. It was an arbitrary element of the um, external direct sum. And we've shown that c does the same thing to that arbitrary element that psi does. So the, the c and the psi uh, must be equal. In other words, that psi is unique. We needed the uniqueness. That uniqueness gives us then that this external direct sum is a coproduct, as we explored earlier, in the category of abelian groups. That was a definition we looked at then. Well, in the categories, uh, coproducts of different sets were equivalent. Equivalence in the category of abelian groups is group isomorphism, uh, as we dealt with in the earlier theorem. So uh, since we're actually dealing with coproducts, then we get the uniqueness claim of this theorem by using the category theory stuff. So this is probably our biggest application of the category theory stuff, in fact. Uh, but we get a uniqueness uh, in terms of coproducts of these external direct sums. <clears throat> because we know any two external direct sums based on that given information will be equivalent in the category, that is, will be isomorphic as groups. And we said something about up to isomorphism. Back to the notes, up to isomorphism. Let me take a parting glance at that. Okay, uh, just a little bit more and we'll take a break and save the rest of this section for later. Um, the use of the homomorphism properties of uh, psi and C, they work because we had uh, we had finite sums as I've worded it here. Yeah, that's where the um, the weakness in an external weak direct product would come from. But remember, when we use additive notation, we call external weak direct products, external direct sums. But anyhow, it was the finiteness. It was the finiteness that let us do that and establish that uniqueness. Uh, the previous result is false if we remove the restriction that the groups are billion. 
Uh, so we drug abelian into the conversation, apparently with good reason, because it isn't true for non-abelian groups. Uh, so the external weak direct product, or if you like the external direct sum, uh, is not in general a co-product in the category of groups. Uh, one of the exercises uh, has you go through by example and establish that. So let's, uh, yeah, let's stop right there. Got a little bit more of this to do and um, some somewhat uh, different topics to deal with in this section, uh, but we're around the mid midpoint of the, um, of the material. So let's go ahead and stop the video there. And I'll come back uh, and finish up this uh, section 1.8 stuff, direct products um, and various uh, incarnations of direct products, weak direct products and so forth. Uh, we'll come back and finish this up shortly. I'll see you then. Have a nice day.